My name is Joe Waters. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Capita. Our purpose is to build a future in which all children and their families flourish. And we are exceedingly grateful to American Compass for partnering with us on this conversation uh, today. Uh, Wells, thank you, and to your whole team. Uh, we also are grateful for these distinguished panelists, and I will stop talking so you can hear from them. Our pattern tonight, uh, today, will be that we'll have 20, 20 or so minutes of remarks from uh, you all, followed by responses from our panelists, and then some free-flowing and, and open conversation. And as we are listening to them, the beer is chilling, and I hope you'll stay for that. Uh, well, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I, I appreciate the, the chance and the opportunity to uh, restore our faith in panel discussions uh, in person again. We'll see if we still know how to do this. Um, and I, I'm very grateful to Capita for the work you do and for the emphasis on families and on children. I'm grateful to American Compass for co-hosting this um, and to Christine, Ember, one of my favorite columnists, for being here. Um, I, I would not say that I have 20 minutes of remarks to open with for you, but I think that I have a bit to say that might uh, lay the groundwork for a conversation on the connection between the, the decay of American institutions, maybe we would say, and the state of the American family, our first and foremost institution. Um, I think it's worth saying a bit about the, the concept of institutions and why we might worry about contemporary American life in terms of institutions now. Because I think that that's a more complicated subject to take up than the state of the family, important as it is. And in a way, I would suggest to you that the lens of institutions and of, uh, and, and of institutional decline and of confidence in institutions can offer us a path to seeing some of the elements of the challenge of the contemporary family crisis that might be hardest to see and ultimately might be most important to understand. So let me start with a few thoughts about why I've tried to think in the last few years about a whole range of American problems in terms of the condition of our institutions. This is a time we're living in that I think can safely be described as a kind of social crisis. A time when in a variety of ways and through a variety of symptoms, we can, see a, uh, we can see a breakdown in the ways in which Americans live together. You see some of that in, a, in, in partisan vitriol, division, polarization. You see some of that in a very bitter and wide-ranging kind of culture war that seems to present itself in every arena of American life. You see it also in some Americans' personal lives, in an increase in suicide rates, in a, in a pervasive uh, opioid abuse crisis in parts of our society. These are problems that seem like they are related, and yet the, the common threads that tie them together are not obvious. They're not the easiest thing to point to. I think part of the reason for that is when we think about these problems, we tend to think about American life in individualistic terms. We tend to think about it as a kind of open space where the, the, that's, that's full of individuals who are having trouble connecting, who are having trouble linking up somehow. And so we talk in terms of metaphors of building bridges, of tearing down walls, leveling playing fields. I think these things are all, these things are all very important. They do get at some very significant truths about our contemporary situation. But there's something they miss. And that something involves the structure of our social lives, the shapes, the forms of what we do together. So that if we think about American life as a big open space, it's not just a space filled with individuals. It's a space filled with these structures of social life. It's a space filled with institutions. Um, the term institution is very broad and capacious. If you try to work your way through the academic literature on the definition of institution, you will lose faith in academic literature very quickly because it means everything. Um, and you know, the, there's the, the political scientist Hugh Hecklow wrote a wonderful book called Thinking Institutionally about 15 years ago, where he actually catalogs for his sins uh, more than 100 of these definitions and tries to break them down into categories, tries to figure out whether it's, it, it's in disciplinary terms or uh, in, in, in a, a variety of kinds of uh, terms of academic theory that you can break them down. 
But ultimately, when we think about institutions in a, in a way that might be, shed some light on our contemporary social situation, I think it might be useful to reach for a, a simpler definition, a more straightforward definition, an Aristotelian definition, at least for me that's where it comes from. When I think about institutions, I'm talking about the durable forms of our common life, the shapes and structures of what we do together. Um, and you know, that some institutions are really organizations, a company, a school, uh, a hospital, a political party. They, they have a formal uh, corporate structure and they're clearly organized institutions. Some institutions are less formally organized than that, but are just as clearly durable forms of common action, things like a, a profession um, or the rule of law. These are institutions because they structure and shape common action. They're not just a bunch of people. They're a bunch of people who are organized together around a common purpose. And the institution gives them roles in relation to one another and to that purpose. They help them know, who am I in the effort to achieve this? What's my job here in relation to her job and his job? And ultimately, that helps us have a place. It helps us understand that place in relation to things we care about in life. Every institution performs some crucial task. Maybe it educates children, maybe it helps the poor, maybe it just produces and sells a product. Um, and in the process of forming, in the process of, of, of achieving that goal, the institution also forms the people in it to do that work in a particular way. So that there is such a thing as, say, an accountant in the world. There is such a thing as a legislator. There's such a thing as a mother. There's such a thing uh, a, a, as, as a political leader. And that's a result of the formative power of our institutions. So that to say that an institution is a social form is to say also that it is formative of the people on whom it operates, and especially the people within it. It imposes on them some idea of integrity, some structure of work, some relationship to others. And when we see them in the world, we understand them in terms of that institution. If, if you're going to be able to trust a journalist, it's because you, you think that person is shaped by some ideal of integrity that is enforced by an institutional mechanism so that when that person speaks, you have a sense that what they're saying has been through some process, has been formed in some way, so it's not just somebody's opinion, but it, it's the product of an institution. Um, when we think about institutions now in American life, we, we might think first about our loss of trust in institutions. This is a widely understood reality. It's almost a cliche by now. Americans are losing confidence in institutions in every arena. And the, the evidence for it is, is very, very deep by now. Uh, Gallup has been tracking trust in institutions since the early 1970s. And the trend across the range is downward. Every institution except the US military, and the reason for that actually has a lot to do with the fact that it started at a very low level in the early 1970s, um, every institution has seen a decline in public confidence. Public institutions and private ones, political institutions, big corporations, the banks, the universities, over and over you find that Americans had an unbelievable level of trust in them in the middle of the 20th century. I think, by the way, in some ways, too much trust in many of them in the middle of the 20th century. And by this point, there is very, very little trust in them. Uh, so that at any given time, about a quarter of Americans say they trust the presidency, uh, a, a little under a third say they trust the federal government in general. There's very little trust in banks, in universities, in companies, in schools, in the medical system. Trust in Congress in Gallup's numbers last year was at 11 percent. Um, and you know, you, you almost have to wonder even who are those 11 percent? What are, what are they thinking? Um, there, there's no doubt that we have lost confidence in a lot of our a lot of our core institutions. But what does that actually mean? to say we don't trust institutions. I don't think we stop enough to ask ourselves that question. At some level, to, to mistrust an institution maybe is to believe that it is corrupt or to believe that it is incompetent. And plenty of our, institution off, uh, of our institutions now offer evidence of both of those things. Uh, but that's always true. And you can always find reasons to doubt the competence or the integrity of a lot of institutional actors. It doesn't explain the accelerating decline in trust uh, over the last several decades, and especially in the last two decades. I think one factor that's especially important to explaining that decline in trust is the, the transformation of expectations of institutions that we've gone through in the 21st century. 
we've gone in, in a sense from thinking of institutions as formative, as shaping the people in them in a particular way, to seeing them as performative, as offering people a platform to build their own brand, to build their own following, to display themselves, to elevate themselves. So that a lot of the institutions we might look to to form human beings in our society have become instead platforms to display human beings in our society. Uh, you know, if you check in on Twitter right now, you find a lot of journalists who are using the capital of the, of the institutions they're part of to build their own following and to, uh, to, to display themselves as individuals out in the world. If you step back from Congress and think, what's actually going on here? You'd find a lot of the same thing happening. Members who use the institution as a platform to build a bigger social media following, to get a better time slot on cable news, and who you wouldn't really describe as legislators, and, I, and who wouldn't even describe themselves as legislators, but who see themselves as performers in that grand theater of our, uh, of our culture war, and who see Congress as a particularly appealing and high platform for prominence in that arena. Uh, surely Donald Trump thought this way about the presidency and understood what he was doing in those kind of performative terms. And the trouble is when we think of institutions as fundamentally performative and not as formative, when we think of them as displaying people rather than uh, constraining them and shaping them, they become much harder to trust. They're not really asking for our trust, they're asking for our attention. And institutions like that become much harder to trust. Now, I, 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 I said sort of in passing that the family is the first and foremost institution. Of, of every society, and I think that's surely true. It's especially true in that formative sense, in that the family forms us more than any other institution. It is the place where we land, unformed when we are born, um, and where we gain a sense of what it is to be a human person, and therefore in a sense where we are most fundamentally shaped and formed. And so the, the, the breakdown of our institutions to the degree that it extends itself to our families as well, and in many ways it has, um, makes it much more difficult for the family to perform that core formative function. The family has other functions, every institution does. It provides for our material needs, and that's very important. Um, it offers us a, a, a kind of recognition and status in society, and that's very important. And those two things have remained very prominent in how we think about the family. But its formative purpose, the way in which it shapes our character, the way in which it shapes our souls, the way in which it molds us into human persons, um, ha has become a less prominent way to think about the family in our public debates and public discussions about family life in recent decades. Because that formative sense is controversial. Um, it, it, it acts as a kind of constraint on choice and on freedom. And to the degree that our institutions do that, they've become harder for us to accept and to celebrate. We, we think in terms of individual freedom and, uh, and choice when we think about the legitimacy of various institutions, and to the degree that they constrain that choice, they become harder for us to appreciate and to, and to celebrate. I think the, the breakdown of family forms that we have seen in American life now for many decades, the breakdown of marriage um, and the, the, the resulting in a lot of ways, really cataclysmic effects for childbearing and for several generations now of Americans who have, of whom too many have grown up in broken families and have been left with less, with fewer opportunities, with less of a chance to rise in our society as a result, despite heroic efforts by, by single mothers in particular to give their children opportunities. That kind of breakdown has to be understood in conjunction as part of the larger story of the breakdown of American institutions more generally. And when we think about our responsibility for uh, recommitting to institutions, for reinforcing and strengthening institutions, I think we have to think especially about the place of the family in the social crisis we're living through and ask ourselves, how can we create the conditions that might make it possible for family forms to be strengthened again? or for new family forms to be pursued given the realities that many Americans live with now? Um, that's a hard question, and it's an especially hard question to ask when so many of our other institutions are breaking down as well. So I, I think this is by way of maybe laying out a few kind of parameters for our larger conversation, but I think the question of the family has to be understood in the context of that larger breakdown of American institutional forms as both cause and effect. 
Weaker families make it harder for us to commit to other institutions, but this transformation of other institutions also makes it harder for us to commit to the family and, and to accept the demands that it makes on us. The family ultimately uh, places extreme limits on our freedom of choice. Uh, even the chosen relationships within families end up functioning as constraints on choice, and some of the most important relationships are not chosen, and yet form binding obligations. I think these are some of the deepest questions that confront any free society. They've been questions that every liberal society has had to think about and worry about uh, for 300 years now, because within the family, there really is no liberalism, and the question of how a liberal society can support the family is a very, very complicated and convoluted question. It's especially hard for us now, so I'm just grateful for the chance to talk about it with folks who are smart about it, and maybe I'll stop there. Thank you, you all. Um, Christine, could we start with you with about five minutes of, of reflection and response? Okay. And if you don't mind, yes. Using, and then Wells and Ian. Sure, I, I thought that that was incredibly helpful actually in laying out both the role of institutions and how they've changed. I, I think the most interesting the most interesting moment I found there, and something that I've been thinking about a lot actually, is this question of uh, commitment and dependency. The fact that we ought to be committed to our institutions, that that is what they ask of us, that's what they need to actually survive. And then in turn, we become dependent upon them for formation, for connection, um, for a hint towards something that we could be working towards, something larger. And the point about liberalism, I think, uh, was very well taken because I do think that sort of the, the individualistic ideal, the atomization of our society has contributed to the breakdown in, in institutions because we no longer feel that we should be dependent on anything. We feel that it's a constraint to be committed to something. I think the transformation of our institutions. Enough. Oh, here we are. Uh, <laughs> the betterment of our institutions and ourselves as individuals within them will actually have to start on a much, I think, higher level than necessarily just making sure that we are, you know, telling the truth on Twitter or representing, you know, our our job or hospital or workplace well. I think that we will have to find ways to make commitment and dependency, um, being interlocked with other people, being constrained, attractive. I think we have to find a way to make those commitments seem beautiful rather than harmful. And I'm not entirely sure where to start with that, but I think in many institutions and also in the lives of many individual people, we're seeing that understanding grow slowly and subtly perhaps, but especially during a pandemic where we were actually atomized, individualized, could not necessarily depend on others, were in fact alone. The idea of having someone to lean on, that you, someone who you, or something that you care for and that cares for you, became very appealing. And I think as we continue to see crises of you know, loneliness in our society, we grow to see the value of commitment to a relationship, uh, commitment to a place, um, dependence on a group, and an interlockedness that is actually incredibly helpful. So if we know that people are feeling those urges, what do we do to bring them to the truth of those? How do we make the institutions attractive? How do we retrain society to value those very things that we have sort of disdained um, in a kind of neoliberal atmosphere for the past 20 to 50 years. I think that's the big question that we'll be facing us next. Well, thank you. I appreciate those remarks. And I, I, I always appreciate your thoughts, you've all, on the need for policymakers especially to think more institutionally. Um, when I think about the family and its relationship to institutions, I think about the way that institutions should serve families. Um, it's one thing to be formed by an institution we know are reformed in families, but to be formed by others, it, it, that requires membership. Um, but I, I, I think too often, I think this gets to the point about thinking of institutions as platforms as opposed to molds, is that institutions become symbolic. 
um, they aren't participatory and they aren't materially needed in, uh, the, the, in, in, in the way that really is necessary for us to belong to a group. And so just as I think about, I mean, the work that we do at Compass, thinking about reforming institutions, reforming policy to better support families, uh, at least a few domains of institution building and renewing come to mind with a mindset of uh, uh, reestablishing connection of material need for membership, then also ensuring that the membership there is participatory. And so you get the, 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 the build on effects of participation and membership in an institution. Um, the, the, the first is the labor market. It's, it, it's one that we ultimately, we materially depend on. We need to receive an income, we need to receive a wage to support ourselves. Um, it, it, it also dictates so much of our lives to where we spend at least 40 hours a week. Uh, it depends how we, it, it, it determines where we spend that time, how we spend our time, and so on. But it's also one of the institutions where it's most deinstitutionalized, seemingly. There are firms, but there's really nothing to represent workers, and really the relationship between labor and management, labor and firms, is totally deinstitutionalized. Uh, and, and this, I think, is a function of sclerosis, which is a term that you brought up in your remarks, Yuval, where we have an organized form of the labor union, for instance, but it, 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 it was built in a very different economy, a very different time, and has placed certain strictures on the ways that workers can organize. Uh, and, and, and can think about how they may more creatively really relate to one another and to management. So that seems to be a place where we should be doing some rebuilding and some rethinking uh, about institution building beyond just sort of the traditional form of the union, which is historically weak. There's energy around trying to organize, but not really a sense for what those institutions ought to look like. It should be bottom up and participatory, as I said. Uh, but we also need to think about, the, 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 about trying to satisfy those workers' material needs to make it attractive. Um, the second is the domain of education. Um, schools are essential to child rearing, of course. Uh, they, they augment and, and, and supplement the work that parents do. They also, of course, are in a moment of crisis, uh, particularly, I think, on the right of center, um, with sort of calls for you know, a renewal of parents' rights. It's, it, it, it really is sort of the, 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 the typical predictable response to an institutional crisis, is a call for greater choice and greater transparency. Um, I think that presents an opportunity for rethinking the role of institutions, but it, it, it also, I think, um, in, in trying to place parents at the forefront, I think also potentially ignores their longer term needs and desires, which is, they, they, at least in our polling, we, we find that parents want their children to lead decent lives not necessarily to maximize academic potential, to not be subjected to the strip mining process that our meritocracy creates where it takes the best talent from communities and ships them off elsewhere and better serves those parents' needs. It seems there's a place where beyond just the call for parents' rights and choice and accountability, there's actually a need for rethinking what that institution is for. What should education be for, not only in, ter in terms of serving the immediate interests of parents, but their longer term aspirations as well. And then the last is just in the domain of public policy where, um, and, and in particular with the welfare state, where I think there's a failure of thinking institutionally, where we talk about the family as being the basic unit of society, but it's far from the basic unit of public policy. Um, it, it, the family formation is treated as an outcome of policy as opposed to an objective, and the family is not treated as a unit of public policy when it comes not only to the eligibility for benefits, who receives, who shares and so on. So that's another place where I hope that we can discuss and maybe think a little bit more creatively about how uh, 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 public policy can be thinking of the family as a unit of public policy as opposed to merely the individual. All right. Um, well, thanks so much. Excuse me. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, this, is, this is wonderful. Um, so you, well, you, you end your book with a, a wonderful stirring call for us to recommit to our institutions, to throw ourselves into them, take responsibility for them, form them and be formed by them. So I think there are a lot of cases, a lot of institutions in our lives where that's just exactly the right advice. Um, the, the picture that you give, the sort of negative picture uh, preceding that is is that a lot of our institutions are sort of rudderless these days. There's, there's no one who really owns them and really takes responsibility for them, and cares for them, et cetera. So again, I think that's right for a lot of our institutions. But I want to point to a, a, a very important subset, a very important family of institutions, where I think that's not, that's not exactly 
that's not exactly what we see. Um, so this, this family of institutions, I think, does lack the sort of humane, committed leadership that you speak of. But at the same time, in a strange way, are, are not rudderless at all, are deeply efficient, um, form their members, um, pursue their goals, punish dissent, reward compliance, et cetera. So I'll, I'll start with an example. So I, for the past few years, have been uh, teaching business ethics in a, a, a business school. And I'm very conscious that this is one of the last opportunities anyone's gonna have to talk to these kids before they enter the ecosystem of American corporate business. And that that ecosystem will shape them and form them to a very significant degree. Um, so we talk about these, these different cases where a CEO had a, an opportunity to make a huge windfall for a company, but they would have to do something kind of wicked. Or they'd have to decimate a community, hurt people, et cetera. And my students are wonderful people, and they always think that this is bad when CEOs do this. And they always say, well, that's pretty underhanded, pretty slimy, et cetera. And I say, OK, so you're the CEO. What do you do? Almost to a person, they say, oh, I pulled the trigger. Like, I absolutely do that. And I say, well, that's not very good. <laughs> like, you wouldn't hurt me, I don't think. You wouldn't hurt your classmates. You're very decent people. Why would you do that? And they say, because if I don't do it, the shareholders will find someone who will. Right, so there's this sense that, and so the institution is strong, right? It forms people, it pushes them where it wants them to go, and yet there isn't necessarily sort of a human leadership there that is visionary and pushing and defining and, and, and guiding people along. Ultimately, in that case, you know, we are the ones in charge there, right? Through our 401ks, through our futzing around on the, the Robinhood app, whatever. Um, we own those companies, and I have no idea how they're performing ethically, right? And I make my decisions based on the bottom line. And sometimes the bottom line requires us to act, or, or you know, pursuing the bottom line alone can, can cause us to behave very unethically. Um, another example, I, I spent some time at, in a hospital in my work at the medical school. Um, you know, the doctors there find themselves, and the nurses find themselves deeply formed by the institution um, in ways that make it almost impossible to care well for patients, right? They're pressed to see far more patients than you could see in a serious way. You have to kind of run through them. And if you don't, the institution will dock your pay, right? And I, I have a, a colleague, a good friend, who is an excellent doctor and treats his patients like people, and his pay is docked as a result because he spends too long with each patient. Finally, um, I think if you, and this is a very strange thing to say, if you look at, at some ways that, that a lot of our institutions have developed over the past 30 years or so, what you see is almost a lot of these institutions taking on their own interests, separate from the interests of the people who are in them, right? The institution almost having its own opinion, right? So we see, for instance, a massive shift of risk away from institutions and on to individuals. Um, and we see that across lots of government, you know, private sector, et cetera. We could, we could talk about examples. And in each case, it's people, it's individuals making the choices against their own best interest because that's what the institution demands. And if they don't de-risk the institution, someone will. So in, in that context, and, and given the power and centrality of a lot of these kinds of sort of zombie institutions that I'm talking about, you know, it's hard to see how your, your very correct call for me and you to take, you know, take ownership of the things, the institutions we participate in, how it applies there. Right? And so I, I'm wondering, maybe alongside your call for you and I to sort of take responsibility for our institutions, how you would understand the sort of larger systemic context in which these memberships happen and, and you know, how far are we willing and able to go to sort of discipline these bad institutions that are forming people badly and, and you know, what's the role of government, with, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So. Here too. That's yeah. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much for 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 those comments and um, and for digging deeper into the subject we're here to talk about together. Um, just a few words on on what each of you said, but I think there's more to build out in conversation from all three of those comments. Um, Christine suggests, and I think it's quite right, that in a sense we are in need of a recovery of the case for uh, 
commitment and for interdependence. And I would say that m more than needing to make those attractive to people, we need a vocabulary that allows us to admit that they are attractive already. Um, I think that, that commitment and dependence and interdependence are very attractive to, to, to younger Americans now. Um, the, the, a huge amount of the hunger that's out there that feels like it's going unmet is exactly a hunger for something to commit to, for something to be, uh, to be constrained by. There's a reason why the, the forms of American religion that are most orthodox and most demanding are the ones that are most attractive to younger Americans now. And those that have tried to liberalize precisely to attract young liberal Americans are having the least luck attracting exactly those people. It's because there's something we want that we don't have a language for describing our desire for. And that something looks a lot like commitment and interdependence. The language of the liberal society is a language of independence. And we're inclined to think that by making people dependent, we make them less free. But at some level, we know that's not really true. And I think that in some ways, one of the reasons for me to think about a vocabulary of recommitment to institutions is to try to recover some vocabulary for that kind of hunger, to explain that kind of desire, which is, a, which is ultimately a desire for flourishing that's rooted in a recognition that we only flourish when we are bound together in some way, um, that there is no such thing as flourishing on your own. Um, I, I think that, that that connects to what Wells had to say in relation to the importance of belonging um, and of an institution enabling you to be part of something. I, 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 it struck me in the course of the, of the pandemic that th there's a way that we ought to break down our understanding of what it is to be connected to other people. Um, that that th 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 there's a part of connection that was enabled by technology that, that we could still do. You could still have meetings on Zoom. And, you know, they were still meetings for good and bad. But there was something about them that wasn't fully there. And I think that ultimately, being together is part communication and part communion. And we overvalue the part that is communication, and we undervalue the part that is communion. You can communicate all you want on Zoom, but you haven't really been with the people that you're communicating with. And a huge amount happens through the medium of that kind of communion that's only possible in an interpersonal way, and it can't really be replaced by, uh, by, by mediating our interactions through, uh, through the internet or, or through electronic communication. I think that has something to say to us about social media, quite apart from the pandemic. I think it has something to say to us about the nature of how we've come to think about communication and belonging. And I think that concept of belonging has a huge amount to do with with communion, much more so than with than with communication, um, and finally, Wells makes a point that I think also connects to what Ian has to say when he when he points to sclerosis as one of the problems we have to think about. Um, I think this concept of sclerosis is very important for understanding the contemporary American situation. Um, you know. It, it, there's, there's kind of a cliche we all use now that says we, we used to have a unifying vision that held us together as a nation, and we've lacked a vision now for too long. I think it may be the case that we actually have a vision, but that that vision is rooted in the life cycle of the baby boomers. Um, that that's the American story that we've lived with now for a long time. It's a, it, it's, it's a, it's a, a vision of America that thinks that America was great uh, when the boomers were young and has become less great as they have become less young. And that by now is old and falling apart and has real trouble thinking about the future. Um, you know, if you, if you were born uh, at the peak of the baby boom in, in 1950, then you too would remember the 50s as a simple time of, of solid families and everything was simple and worked out. If you actually lived in America in the 1950s, I don't think you would remember it that way, because that's not what the 1950s were like at all. But that's what they seemed like if you were, uh, if you were born uh, in, in 1950 or in the 40s. 
Uh, similarly, you know, you would think of the 60s in a way that's not exactly right, but that, you know, that, that, that is viewed through the eyes of a teenager. The 70s through the eyes of a kind of 20-something entering the working world, and in the 80s you were coming into your own and had a mortgage. In the 90s everything was great. I mean, you, the, you know, you, you, you were in charge. And ever since then you've been a little over the hill. And you're really not sure if this is going to work out. Um, and you're increasingly uh, disoriented by what is becoming of American life. This is not the America we know. That's what things look like if you, you know, if, if you're Donald Trump or Bill Clinton or George W. Bush, all of whom were born within two months of each other in 1946. Um, that's what things look like. But if you're not, um, and if you're a younger American trying to think about the future, I think you're enormously constrained by, by sclerosis at this point, by a sense that this country just can't be what it used to be. Well, sure, it can't be what it used to be. Nothing can be what it used to be. But there are a lot of things this country can be. And I think we have to think about addressing the problems we have by thinking forward, by asking ourselves, what are we going to need in 20 years that we don't have now? That's what a functional democratic politics does. And our politics now is not doing that, to put it mildly. Um, and I think that connects to your point too, Ian, because I, it seems to me that what you describe is more like a vacuum of responsibility than it is like a, an, an excess of, of institutional strength. It's not so much that, that, the, that the corporate mentality is so self-confident that it can't be uh, resisted. It's that the, the, the sorts of social forces that would normally resist it are largely absent. Um, that would keep our society in balance between a dynamic economy on the one hand um, and a, a free and democratic and ethically morally oriented society on the other. Um, a lot of the forces that would make that possible are not present in the degree they ought to be. I, I think Wells's point about, about labor is, is an important way into that. Um, the, the, th th there's an easy case for the purpose behind organized labor in contemporary America. We clearly need something like it. There's less of a case for the particular form that organized labor took at its high point in the 1950s and early 60s in the United States. Instead, there's an argument for a different form, and our politics is just not in good shape to take on arguments for different institutional forms to meet needs we have as a society. There are a lot of things we need that way. To govern the internet, uh, to, to think about the, the kinds of challenges to, to parenthood and childhood that we face today. To think about corporate uh, consolidation and, uh, and concentration in ways that are actually responsive to the realities of the 21st century economy. Um, we're doing very, very little of that kind of work which should just be the everyday work of our political life in, in, a, in a moment of flux like this. And so yes, I think some of that has to do with the fact that, um, th that, that some of the actors in our, in our market economy have lost sight of their responsibilities as citizens. But I think it has even more to do with vacuums in other places. And I'll just close with that. I, I think we have to be alert to ways in which some of the problems we have are about things that aren't there. Not what we have too much of, but what we don't have enough of. Um, I think this way as a, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a recovering political scientist, and w when you look at the problems with our constitutional system, your first inclination is to see what we have too much of. So the presidency is too strong and big, the administrative state is overgrown, the courts are overactive. All of that is a function of Congress being too weak. Um, it's the result of a vacuum, and the fact that other people re respond by filling the vacuum, well, that's not surprising. What's surprising is that there's this vacuum. Um, I think there's a similar way of thinking about many of our other, uh, many of the other problems our society faces now, where we have to ask ourselves not only what do we need to get rid of, but what do we not have enough of? And that, again, is, is a, a, a sort of question that would lead you back in the direction of coherent institutions. I think that's a lot of what we don't have enough of. Great. Thank you. Um, we will have time for your questions here in just a few minutes. But uh, in the meantime, I, you all want to follow up on that last point, and particularly for the people who are here today. What are the sorts of habits that we should be cultivating, that policymakers in particular should be cultivating to think more institutionally, to do that 20-year long-term 
visioning for what our future as a country might look like? Well, I think that in a way those are two different questions. Um, I, I think first of all, for each of us, there is, there is a, there's a kind of responsibility we could take on when it comes to the institutions that we each are part of. Some of us um, are, are involved in political institutions, and so in a sense that, that answer would be related to the challenge that policymakers face. But all of us are involved in some set of institutions, familial and communal and professional, maybe religious or educational. And we can each ask ourselves, given the role that I have in that set of institutions, given the roles I've got, what should I be doing? Not just what do I want to be doing, not just what I want to be seen to be doing, but given the role I have here as a, as a parent or as a boss or as an employee or as an educator, uh, as a physician, w w what should I do in this moment of decision that confronts me right now? Um, asking that kind of question, I think, is a, is a way of inviting responsibility. And in a lot of ways, what we lack now are occasions to, to welcome and, and acknowledge responsibility. Um, and so a lot of what we think of as institutional failures are fundamentally failures of responsibility in that way. And if you, if you think about it, a lot of the people who most drive you crazy in American life now are people who just obviously fail to ask that question when they should ask that question. You know, how could he do that when he is the president or when he is uh, a priest or when he's in charge of this whole place? How could he act that way? That's, th that's what happens when we fail to think of the roles we have in life uh, before we make a decision. I think that's connected to the kinds of challenges that policymakers face. But, you know, in a way, for me, the, the, the challenge for policymakers does come back to that question of sclerosis. Policymakers have allowed themselves to be locked into, uh, you know, to, to, it, it, ha have allowed themselves to put on a kind of straitjacket, which they could just take off and they don't realize it. Um, the, the, the familiar categories of partisan dispute that we've inherited from the second half of the 20th century are not actually required. There are ways out of them. Both parties have persuaded themselves that the only way to win an election is 50% plus one voter, and the way to do that is to make sure that everybody who already loves you turns out to vote. And so nobody's really thinking about wh what you might have to offer voters that you're not already offering and that maybe they're not even explicitly asking for, but that the, quest the, the concerns that, that, uh, that they confront in their lives should point toward. Or a simpler way to put it is, very few of our politicians are thinking about what America is going to need 20 years from now. Because they think that if the next election goes the wrong way, there won't be a 20 years from now. It will fall off the cliff, or you know, the, 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 the oceans will rise, and we will all drown. That's a way to avoid responsibility. And you know, they have to begin by recognizing that we are going to be here 20 years from now. And what will be available to us as resources for national flourishing is up to them today. Um, and I, I think both parties at this point basically fail that, that core test of statesmanship in our democracy. Um, it's up to citizens too, and voters clearly aren't demanding it. But I, I think that the, the simple task of thinking about the future um, is, is where policymakers have to begin. Some of that's just gonna be generational transition. You know, people born in the 1940s are gonna turn 80 in the 2020s. Um, at the moment, all of our political institutions at the national level are run by people born in the 1940s. That's really weird, and it's not going to continue forever. I mean, it is, it's important to see how strange that is, uh, that people in their late 70s would be, it would be in charge of, of all three branches of government is a little weird. Um, and it's not ultimately good for our country. I wish them long lives, don't get me wrong, but they should live them in retirement. And it, it, it is really time on, on all fronts um, for some transition. Ideally, of course, to Gen Xers, um, naturally. But in any case, some generational transition. That's great. Well, I want to follow up on a point you made about family as the basic unit of public policy. I think that's actually an argument that Daniel Patrick Moynihan made in America in 1965 or so. But my question for you is what are the institutional forms that would be necessary, particularly at the federal level, to sustain that vision? Sure. Um, is it one? Sure. Um, 
Yeah, so, sure. Um, yeah, the the there are I think you know a few a few places where this I think would most directly apply, and I, and I think they're mostly within sort of the welfare and entitlement space. Um, uh, you can think, for instance, of the ways in which you know your eligibility for unemployment insurance, right, uh, could could be transferred from one spouse who say takes a job immediately and is able to transfer that to a different spouse um, uh, if they still are, are out and and and. And, and, and trying to find a job, or within the welfare state, um, uh, you know, for work requirements, for instance, to apply to both earners or all earners within a home as opposed to just a single earner. But I think it also means also accounting for the intergenerational aspect of families. Um, you know, you, you hear a lot on the right of center, it's sort of a silver bullet for public policy, sort of the idea of like, you know, you know an individual savings account, right? And we, and we, and, and we have these tax exempt savings accounts for retirement, for education, all these types of special purposes. But what if we did this on an intergenerational basis for no particular purpose? Um, why, why is it not that you know, we essentially create trusts for families uh, that don't necessarily have access to those institutional means, where they're exempt from taxes, they can pay in and take out as they see fit, they get to be to cover their debts, to cover sort of, you know, with a you know, you know, you know, loss of income because, because of a job or to fund their vacation. Um, those, those, those are the types of policy reforms, I think, at the federal level, that really, I think, just take creative thinking, as well as thinking about the ways in which in, in incentives and the ideal beneficiaries of benefits and other systems are individuals as, as opposed to families as they exist, which is intergenerational and not always dual earner couples either. Uh, we, our, 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 our system of benefits, our tax code, I think it privileges dual earner families disproportionately. And I think, I think, I think, I think we need to try to, at least to rejigger the system somewhat more in favor of families as they exist, which is to say, not the two earner nuclear model and not just the individual. Thank you. So uh, Christine, I think we heard you all say that the, the family is not liberal and is, is challenged by liberalism. This is an argument that I think Liz Brunig advanced in the last several days. So given what Wells just said about creating a, a situation where the family is the unit of public policy, is that possible in a liberal democracy like ours? I think and what are the, some of the challenges you foresee for that? Sure, um, I think that it is possible, certainly. Um, but it will take a, a rethinking and renewed action. I mean, tacking back to um, the term that Ian used, zombie institutions, which I thought was particularly apt. We know what to do with zombies, right? <laughs> Ostensibly, <laughs> we kill zombies. Um, but as you've always pointed out, what it seems like we have been doing um, on, in both political parties for the past several decades is just sort of find ways to keep them shambling along um, by our same old means, maybe with like a few new uh, injections here and there, but just basically keep doing the same thing. And I think that if we actually want to bring the family into policy, um, we'll have to, to kill those zombie ideas and actually be ready to really rethink the way that we do policy, rethink what is possible um, within our political arena, within individual lives, within our conversations and how we speak of things. I mean, we saw this during the pandemic uh, at some level. Because we had a crisis, we were willing to rethink, at least for a moment, our ideals about you know, welfare and workfare and how people should be given money and how we should track them. You know, and we had these injections of cash for families that in fact lifted children out of poverty. And these, this was something that would be unthinkable in normal times because you know, it's not how things were done. It's not what we're used to. It's not the sort of requirement bound system that we had had in place for the past 20 years. Um, and I think to, to make any of these major changes that would actually make our institutions work better, or at least work in the way that we imagine they should towards the purposes that we need them to fulfill. We just have to be willing to radicalize ourselves in some ways and actually admit that that needs to be the case. Ian, I know you well enough to know that radicalization probably sounds pretty good in terms of institutions. I think you probably are certainly an advocate too of zombie massacre. So how, how would you react to what Christine just shared? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, we all sense the sclerosis. We all sense that we're in lots of ways treading water. Um, people, you know, like Peter Thiel and Ross Dowd that have been talking about decadence and sclerosis for a while now, and um, you know, not necessarily with a deep explanation of why we see it and why we see it across like the film industry and academia and tech development and business. It's just too broad a thing to be easily explained. Um, when I and, and again, I, I may place too much an <laughs> importance in anecdotes from my students, but when I talk to them about why they're all going into finance um, and why they're not pursuing other things that they're way more passionate about or doing things that they love, um, the, the tenor of the response typically is one of precarity and scarcity. They're like, uh, like, no, 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 I can't, I can't take that risk, right? Like, I at least know that there are probably jobs at Deloitte. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think that in order for people to feel comfortable going out on limbs, rehashing things, starting from scratch, whatever it is that we need to do, and we do need to do some stuff like that, um, people need to feel like they're not going to just entirely fall on their faces and be destroyed. Um, now, uh, I mentioned some things that I think might be you know, causal contributors there, you know, de-risking of institutions and passing that risk on to individuals, um, massive concentration of wealth over the past decades that really do make it so, you know, scarcity is not just an ambiance. For a lot of people, it's a, it's a real fact on the ground. Um, and so, I mean, I, I don't necessarily want to kill all the corporations. <laughs> I think that would probably be a bad thing. Um, but I, I would like to see ways of, of re-understanding things like corporations and governments so that risk is, you know, is, is um, spread you know, more sensibly, so the resources are spread more sensibly to give people the kind of foundation that they would need to, to invent and reinvent you know, the American story. So I'm going to be coming for your questions next, but uh, Yuval, apart from the military, can you give us examples of institutions that you really admire for sort of continuing to exercise formation well and to help you know, people think maybe uh, deeply institutional? Yeah, I think it is important to look for, um, for for examples of what is working and not only what isn't working. And even I would say, you know, maybe maybe it falls to me to speak up for zombies just a little bit. But I, I, I think there are some institutions that are not really replaceable and that we therefore have to renew. Um, there certainly are institutions in our society that are replaceable. Um, and that at least need competition, if not ultimately um, that, that need to be staked through the heart and done away with. Um, but we do have to see that oftentimes the people who are most harmed by institutions that are failing to do their work are the people who most need those very institutions. Um, it is not you know, people who are who are wealthy and powerful in our society would be fine if all the institutions fell apart. Maybe not fine, but they'd be okay. It's especially those people who most need protection, who most need access to opportunity, who most need to be freed from the power of other people, who need our institutions to be functioning well. And that's true especially of our political institutions, but of our educational and religious institutions. And of, and of families. Um, and so th that it is particularly those who are victims of the failures of our institutions who need those to be restored and recovered. And I think part of the work of that recovery does involve a kind of sociology of success. What is working, not just what isn't working. Um, there's a way that the military is part of that story, though I, I would say having really dug into the public surveys on this, a fair amount of that is actually a function of the fact that the military was the only national institution that was not widely trusted in the middle of the 20th century. Um, in the wake of Vietnam, public confidence in the military was very low. Um, and it has risen since then from a very low point, while public confidence in everything else has declined from a very high point. And so the trends do give you a little bit of a misimpression about just how much the public uh, respects and regards the U.S. military. But I think that when you look for solutions and when you look for examples of success, in America it's wise to work from the bottom up and not from the top down. 
and the institutions that are working well for people, broadly speaking, are not going to be national institutions, they're going to be local institutions. Um, I think there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of, of, of religious and cultural and communal institutions that have risen up in this century to address problems that are confronted by immigrant communities, problems that are confronted by lower income Americans, problems that are confronted by people who find themselves at the margins of our society and who have done miraculous work in these areas that are not being well served by our national institutions, but where people have come together to, 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 to take on problems um, and you know, the, 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 there, are, there are various groups out there who are trying to find these success stories and bring them to light. Um, you know, I think of the, of the Weave Project at Aspen and a few others who are trying to bring this to the national stage. But broadly speaking, if you look at this country from the bottom up, it looks a lot better than it does when you judge it by the condition of our federal government and our large national institutions. We do still have some of that capacity to respond to problems by creating something new or to respond to problems by giving new life to something that has been weakened. You see that in, 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 you see that in classical schools, but you also see it in the revitalization of some public school systems around the country. Um, you, you see it in the work of religious institutions, but you also see it in a lot of communal work that doesn't come from churches uh, in a lot of American cities. And so I, you know, I, I, I don't think there's cause to despair here. I think there is a lot of cause to worry about the condition of our national institutions. But ultimately, those are going to be responsive to what happens at the local and the interpersonal level. So I, I am hopeful about America. I don't despair of it. We are nearly at our hour, but I want to make space. If you have any questions for our panelists, uh, hopefully they would. Yeah, a couple. Yes, please. Yes. Thank you all. Um, this has been wonderful to listen to. So I want to ask this question thoughtfully, but I'm curious on um, any of your impressions on this. So you all, you mentioned initially that it was from the 1970s to present that we started seeing this decline in all major institutions. And so thinking about uh, Charles Murray's book, Coming Apart, which talks about the breakdown of not being a race, but actually being a class across society, um, but also thinking about what's happening in the 60s and 70s have um, the Civil Rights Amendment, you have um, a major change in work expectations, women entering the workforce, um, the sexual revolution, and like pretty significant um, societal overhaul. Not certainly all of it bad by any means, and a lot of it good and overdue, but a very big change. Um, and correlation does not always equal causation, but it seems like a pretty concentrated time there where a lot's not going to be happily impacted. So I'm curious to you all and for anyone else, like, how do we understand the impact that those uh, movements and like major changes in our society have on our understanding of institutions, especially when it comes to things like freedom of association and how like that changed the way that we relate to one another? Um, once again, maybe not a bad move, but like it seems to certainly impact it in our relationship with institutions as a whole. Uh, I'll speak to it briefly, but I would say I, I, I wrote a book about this question in 2016 called The Fractured Republic, which I I feel bad recommending to you in this moment, but I will uh, summarize it briefly, very briefly. I, I think that there's a problem with the kind of arguments that trace the decline from that period, and the problem is that they begin in 1960 and take it as a norm. If you, if you step back from Charles Murray's book, which is a very valuable book and a very important book, Bob Putnam does the same thing in his, in his very good book, Our Kids. If you step back from it, it's a bunch of charts about how things have changed in America since 1960. Um, there's very little said about what happened in America before 1960. And 1960 is taken to be a norm, so that you walk away from that book thinking everything was like, the, it was one way until the 60s, and then it was another way. But that's not true at all. Um, the middle of the 20th century was a very, very strange time in America. Much more strange than our time in the context of American history. Um, so that in the wake of, of two world wars and a depression, the country was extremely cohesive and consolidated. It had a lot of confidence in its core institutions. Uh, there was a very strong mainstream consensus in a lot of ways, and if you were part of that consensus, it was great. If you were not, it was very not great. Um, and th that, that process itself you know, was, a, was a response to various kinds of social breakdowns at the end of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th. Um, 
What you find when you look at American culture in that moment, in that high point of the middle of the 20th century, is that people were not happy. They were, they were begging for liberation from conformity, left and right. And the culture began to liberalize economically, that is a more of a market orientation in the economy. And you know, for all the complaints about regulation now, the American economy was much more heavily regulated in the middle of the 20th century than it is today. Um, and also it liberalized socially, giving people all kinds of choices, all kinds of access to the mainstream, a fragmentation of that mainstream culture. There was a lot that was very good about this. We are a wealthier country, we are a more fair and free country because that happened. But there is also another side to that coin, which is that we are a less unified and cohesive uh, society. And we feel that lack of solidarity now. That's the nature of the social crisis we have. I think it's very important to see that that happened for a reason, and that there was a lot of good that was achieved in the course of that liberalization, but that there was also a lot of harm done. And that we have, we're now dealing with that harm. We need to deal with it in ways that don't give up the gains. Um, and that's doable, but it's a challenge, and it requires us to recognize that American life from 1960 till today was not a downward slide. That is not the way to describe it. It, it is better and worse than it was in the middle of the 20th century. And you know, life in our country is always getting better and worse at the same time. And we've got to deal with the problems, but we should also recognize the ways that things are better. And for a lot of people in this country, things are much better. Christine, did you want to jump in? I did. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's a great point, that things have gotten better and worse, and also that there were reasons for the changes that took place. Um, and I think one of the ways to think about this is actually to refer to uh, what you've always saying about asking what individuals, an individual should ask, what should I be doing in this role, in this institution, what my role is? And that's really a question of sort of first premises and uh, expectations. What do you want out of this? Uh, what are our expectations going forward? What were we trying to do here? And that might be a helpful way of looking at these social movements and social changes. Um, it's not necessarily that the changes themselves were bad uh, or you know that the first premises were wrong, but we can ask ourselves, what did we what were we trying to get from these revolutions? Um, the sexual revolution, say, what were we actually looking for out of that? and have we gotten it? Um, changes in the workplace. What exactly was, say, a two-income household supposed to do for us? Uh, what were these revolutions in work life supposed to bring us in the future? Have we gotten those? And then we can you know, go back. I'm sorry, I'm still here massacring zombies. But if we haven't gotten what we were looking for out of the changes, we can still change course. That's, that's the thing that we need to be aware of. We don't necessarily have to abide by sort of a dead consensus. You know, this revolution happened, the outcome was kind of poor, but there's nothing we can do. We're just gonna have to keep rolling along in this way. But we can still change course because we are still human. Our society is still growing and changing. We, many of us are still quite young um, and in a position to make these changes. But first we just have to ask ourselves what we actually want, what we're looking for. Um, since we're mentioning books, I am contractually obligated to tell you. Uh, my first book um, is coming out next month. It's called Rethinking Sex. And it's partially about, actually, the sexual revolution and sort of changes in women's rights and welfare and expectations um, that happened then. You know, an example that I'll give from that book is simply the idea of, say, sex positivity as a concept. Um, when that was, you know, brought into being when that term was first used um, in the 1970s and 80s, actually, as kind of part of the sexual revolution. Um, it meant one specific thing. Um, you know, we were actually talking about the idea that sex could be valuable, that women's feelings about it were valuable, that we, in fact, could, in some ways, take ownership of our lives. That was the goal. Um, that we could sort of respect ourselves more and the way that we lived our lives. That was the goal. Have we gotten there um, on the path that we have taken since? I would argue that maybe not, but that doesn't mean that you know 
the ship that was looked for was bad. That doesn't mean that the hope was bad. It may just mean that we need to begin anew, to rethink our expectations and begin to chart a new path. And that's something that we can do for all of these changes, for all of these parts of society, for many of the institutions that have slid from their original purpose um, when they were founded, you know, whether it's 10 or 100 years ago, there's always still time. Trent, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, so we've, everybody's kind of talked around this idea that um, corporations the only thing that corporations are pursuing is shareholder maximization. And I'm, I'm trying to like connect everything that everybody has said because is the reason why corporations exclusively pursue shareholder maximization because of a vacuum in, in other areas like labor being an attractive thing. And, and if it is that, then what are ways that we're making labor beautiful? And, and the commitment to the, the, the other things that should be filling that space besides just the vacuum that is shareholder maximization. Wells or Ian, you want to start? Um, I, it's a great question. I, I definitely think that a part of it is um, uh, a, 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 a singular pursuit of efficiency and profit. Um, and I think a trying to, I think, simplify and distill the purpose of institutions into being one thing. Um, and I think, I think you see this especially with sort of the emergence of shareholder primacy as a philosophy. It really is to make markets function on a fairly straightforward, you know, you know rules govern system-wide basis um, at the exclusion of other voices. Um, so I think it was both sort of a shift in thinking from sort of constituencies and blocks to which we had responsibility towards systems that were governed by rules and had a particular purpose, but it was also, I think, a loss of, um, of, 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 of power. Um, and, that's, and that's one word that I, we haven't actually brought up in this discussion that's really interesting. I mean, we, 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 we talked about sclerosis and weakness and vacuums, but we haven't talked about power. And that seems to be one of the things that institutions should do well. Um, not just to execute it responsibly, but also to hold others accountable by exercising power well. And so I think one of the ways that we may um, be able to think about, at least within the shareholder primacy context, is how do we have you know, countervailing systems of power within the workplace or outside of it to make sure that there are, at least are other voices that are heard, be it workers or you know, the community leaders that may be affected by business decisions beyond just the interest, the immediate material concerns and interests of shareholders. So the concern for power, but also I think this shift in thinking again from sort of rules that govern markets um, and away from more of an approach of thinking in terms of the sort of the constituencies and groups to which we have an obligation, be it workers, customers, and so on. Great. We will end in just a moment, but I have one last question for all of you. Um, as, as we close, what are the new questions with which you are leaving this conversation? I'm not going to go first because I have to take a moment to think about that. <laughs> Do you have one? Sure, I, I guess I can start. I, I, I think that one very important thought I walk away with has to do with the point that that um, that both Wells and Christine made um, about the importance of remembering that that we're not stuck in a rut; that things can change. Um, I think that that's a that's a fact that's har that's hard for us to see in a lot of different circumstances now in American life. We sort of mistake the the constants for the variables, if you know what I mean. We think the things that are actually up to us are the ones that can't change. And over and over, uh, I mean, I, I'll revert to the work I do in, in, in congressional reform. You talk to a lot of members of Congress, and they complain endlessly about the budget process and the schedule. And when you say to them, well, you know, that's totally up to you. <laughs> and and when, when people hated this in the 1940s, they just changed it completely from scratch. You don't need anybody else's permission. You don't need the president. You don't need to change the Constitution. Just do it. This, this is news to them. 
And I don't say that to make fun of them, because I think a lot of us in those institutions that we operate in think the same way. Um, we think the rules are, are permanent, and they're not. The rules are there to serve a purpose. And if they're not serving that purpose, it is really important that we are able to change the rules within certain bounds. And I think that you know, in our politics, the, the bounds of the Constitution are fine. But we're not acting within those bounds. We're not doing nearly what we could be doing to change some of the basic rules that govern how our, our institutions operate. And I think just remembering that things can change is, is hugely important. So I love Christine's point about uh, remembering why you started doing a thing in the first place. Um, I think, you know, uh, I totally agree with Wells's analysis of how shareholder primacy comes in and, and becomes a, such a dominant thing. Um, that's not necessarily why any given company was started. It's not necessarily why we established the forms that we have now. And I think that a huge question that, that you know, I'll be thinking about is, um, you know, how should we go back to the roots and reconceptualize what we're doing when we, when we form and inhabit these institutions? Um, and you know, what is possible in terms of, of reimagining them? Yeah, I think to, to build on both of those points from Yuval and Ian, um, it, for, for me at least, I'm, I'm coming away with a sense of a need for recovery and remembery um, and trying to remember uh, um, past efforts to uh, to, to, to reinvigorate and reform institutions, not only what the motivations were, but what the intentions were. Um, I, I, I think we can go back in our history and find so many different political analogs for the types of crises that we face. And I think you look back at the writings and the actions of the reformers then, and they make a lot of the same uh, uh, decisions and choices that I think we would think to make today. Um, and, and, and clearly they didn't work out, and so it's both, I think, uh, uh, looking back with hindsight and seeing the unintended consequences that took place, but also I think trying to remember the true purposes uh, and, and, and aspirations of uh, reformers and trying to take the lessons in terms of how we should act and change our approach today. I am still thinking and will continue to think actually about that question of power. Um, I think we've all you know, come to the conclusion here that things can change, that things should change, that we are able to change them. So why aren't we and what is holding us back? Um, and that could be a question of who actually holds the power that we're not acknowledging. Um, that could also be a question of you know, our or our institution's sort of internal fears that we have not necessarily talked about or traditions that we are rooted in in a hidebound way, which is not to say that tradition is bad, but even there, there's a first principle question that you could ask, why, why are we still doing this? Why did we start doing this? What needs to change? Um, so I think exploring sort of the hidden centers of power that are keeping us in the place that we are might also be a good, though perhaps a little frightening, uh, first step to freeing us up to do what we know we can do and what we should do. Well, thank you very much.